It's known as the land of the party people, where soccer, samba and the beach are the lifeblood of the country. But I'm here to discover what makes Brazil a food lover's dream. In a country the same size as the United States, Brazil offers a cuisine rich in regional variety. The extraordinary food is a fusion of the cooking heritage of four main groups of people, the native Indians, Portuguese colonists, the descendants of African slaves, and immigrants from Spain and Italy. Please, no more, I can't take any more meat. My journey starts in the Africanized culinary state of Salvador, takes me to the well-stocked larder of the native Amazonians, and on to the former capital of the Portuguese colonial empire, Alinda, now a gastronomic food haven. Absolutely gorgeous. Next, I head south to the home of the beef-eating European immigrants of Porto Alegre. I end my journey in the multicultural melting pot of Rio de Janeiro. Salvador was the first capital of Brazil. It's now the leading city of Bahia. The heady mix of Portuguese colonial architecture, colourful street life and African culture makes this city one of the highlights of Brazil. Salvador is reputed to have the best food in Brazil. And if the cuisine is nearly as colourful as the city itself, I'm in for a real treat. The local market is where all the Bahians shop. The ancestors of most of the people here were slaves from Senegal or Angola, so it's not surprising that Salvador has often been dubbed Africa in exile. Wow, even the chilies in Salvador are the most fantastic colours. Hi, uh, what, what's this? Uh, oil dinner. Oh. Wow, now this is the dende oil that these guys love here. They use it both for flavour and also for colour, and it is the most incredible colour. And over here, what kind of shrimp are these? Aqui é camarão, camarão seco. Ah, now these are the dried shrimp. They have such an abundance of shellfish here that they dry and salt them, and then they use them as a garnish, and they're supposed to be delicious. Thank you. Thank you. Dried beans of all shapes and colours play an important role in Bahian cuisine, but the most popular are the white beans, which are usually pounded into a puree by the stallholders. The paste is then shaped into vatapa balls, which are deep fried in dende oil. The vatapa ball is stuffed with yellow bean paste, a slippery okra stew, a spicy pepper mix, and finally it's topped with fried shrimp. This speciality is called acarajé. Obrigada. So here goes. It's quite a mouthful. No, I'm just not sure about that. There's something quite slimy in there. I might just quietly go over here and eat prawns on the top. Afro Brazilians eat the same distinctive food as their ancestors. Their African traditions are carried into street life and they still practice their own religion. It's called candomblé and its rituals involving food are still very much part of the Bahian lifestyle today. Candomblé ceremonies are always held in the favela or shantytown suburbs, often just in the front room of somebody's house, and I'm off to see what it's all about. The religious rituals involve the offering of food to the gods. Now these ladies have painstakingly prepared all these dishes for individual gods and the recipes haven't changed for generations. Now over here we've got Oshala and he has all things white because he's the god of all gods. Now Shangu, who's the god of wealth, gets this very rich looking okra stew and Ogun, who's the warrior god, gets black beans and, of all things, popcorn. <laughs> To invoke the gods, the women dance around a plate of food. To satisfy the spirits watching over the house, the plate of food is blessed. The women take it into the street and offer the food to the god or personal protector of the whole favela. As the women become possessed, the spirits enter their souls and another offering is made of white bean curd. The household and community are now safe from any evil spirits. As this celebration continues, a very different one is taking place in the streets of Salvador. Oh, what are you selling? 
Wow, I don't know what this is. How much? One real. Thank you. I'm not quite sure what this. Let's open it up. Oh, I think that's guava. One of my favourites. It's like a kind of guava donut. Very sweet and sticky. Mm, that'll keep me going. are student rolls, like a coconut sticky dessert, and students love them because they're cheap. Mm, and very, very tasty. And if you're thinking of dancing to the beat of these incredible drummers, go easy on the donuts. These guys live on a diet of shrimps and dende oil, so just check out those body movements. Bahian food is just as popular in Salvador's restaurants as it is on the streets. Some of the most sophisticated dishes owe their existence to the Afro-Brazilians. Dada, who owns this restaurant, was brought up in the city slums, where she learned to cook recipes handed down from her grandmother. She started up her first restaurant in a favela, and it became so successful that she opened two more. The food looks absolutely sensational, so I can't wait to find out more about the recipes of her famous Bahian dishes. Hey! Hi! <laughs> now, Dada not only looks fantastic, but she's a very famous chef here in Salvador, and that's because she makes the best moqueca in Bahia. Oh! Now, moqueca <laughs> is a kind of fish and coconut stew. And the first thing we're going to do is make this sort of marinade. So it's garlic going into this big dish here. Sal. Salt. Cebola. Lots of chopped onion. And this is green pepper chopped. And some deliciously red and ripe tomatoes. Cebola. Oh, oh this is uh, spring onions. Mm. Oh. Oh. Getting me to work too. There we go. Quintro, quintro. And this is cilantro or coriander, which they use lots of here and some parsley as well. And they use all the stalk, which I love, because the stalk has most of the flavor, in fact, whereas we often throw it away, but no, no not here. Really <laughs> fresh and vibrant. <laughs> she can't stop laughing. And it's getting pounded. This is sort of, oh, it's gonna make part of our sauce, so it needs a really good pound, so all the flavors kind of mash together and it's gonna infuse our coconut milk later. Okay, now my turn. Now we're going to add some freshly squeezed lime juice. Lots of lime juice. <laughs> Can't tell you how awesome this smells. Oh. Wow, Dada, look at this fish. Isn't he fantastic? <gasps> and the beautiful lobster. Wow. It's like, kind of like a sea bass, this fish. Very white and meaty. Oh. I'm just going to slash the fish. Now, this is brilliant because it means all the flavours will infuse to the inside of the fish and make it unctuous and delicious. <gasps> oh, and then it goes straight onto our vegetables, OK, and then our lobster, which has been split in half. Oh, it's so fresh. He is a beautiful fella. Olive oil. Now, olive oil is going into a very hot pan. Both the olive oil, two, two glasses of olive oil here. Oh. And the lobster's going to go straight in with all the vegetables. Flesh side down so the inside of the lobster's going to cook first. Fill up the, the fat fella. <laughs> all the flavours right inside the fish. We'll put this in together. And this is Dada's homemade coconut milk. Can I taste? Oh, you don't get fresher than that. Okay, Dada, how many ladles? Those four. All over, okay. So now that we've covered the lobsters and nearly all the fish with coconut milk, it's going to cook for about sort of five to ten minutes and then we turn the fish over. I can't tell you the smells that are coming up here now are just so fantastic. To finish off the makeka, garnish with sweet peppers, scallions, parsley and last but not least, dende oil. Cake look good. Just check out Dada's buffet. It looks awesome. I don't know where to start. 
This really is a feast for all the senses. Not only does it taste good, it looks good, it smells good, and that's exactly what Dada's philosophy is all about, bringing sensuality and spirituality together. And that combined with the amazing seafood they have here, which they really know how to cook. There's codfish salad, there's steamed clams, there's risottos, there's lobsters. You can so see why the people here in Brazil revere the Bahian cuisine. Mm. to be enjoying the maqueca. From Salvador with its Africanized culinary influences, my journey takes me to the Amazon, Mother Nature's well-stocked food store and the home of the native Brazilians. It's the largest tropical rainforest on earth and the fruits of the forests and rivers have ensured that its inhabitants are amongst the healthiest people in the world. The colonists that arrived on the east coast didn't realize that further north lay one of the world's richest areas for natural food resources. The native Indian culture is still very much alive here in the Amazon and I've come to find out more about the food they eat. The rivers of Amazonia are the arteries of the region and vital for the transportation of food and passengers. All the waterways here are teeming with more fish than anywhere else in the world, yet most is either for local consumption or for the Amazonian cities of Manaus and Belém. Now, I've neither seen or tasted an Amazonian fish before, so Anato here is going to catch me one. You got something? We caught oh, something. Ah, oh, he's beautiful. What, what kind of fish is this? Atukunare. It's bright yellow. It's fantastic. Thank you. Can we cook this? We you can eat this. Nonato's recipe is very simple. You just squeeze fresh lime juice all over the fish, then rub it with salt. Because of the high humidity in the jungle, the Amazonians eat lots of salt. A little bit more lime to suit your palate. And then you wrap it up in a banana leaf, or you could use baking foil. The important thing is to make a parcel to seal in the juices. Obrigada. Now there's nothing I like more than simply cooked fish. My journey takes me into the heart of the Amazon jungle to find out more about the extraordinary fruits of the forest. I've been told that this creek will lead me to a woman who really knows how to serve up a hearty Amazonian breakfast. Rose Marina makes pancakes every morning. The only ingredient is locally produced tapioca flour. The jungle provides her with raw materials, so coconut oil is used to moisten the pancakes. Hello. This looks fantastic. Wow. Oh, this is tapioca. Tapioca. You smell good. Mmm. Scrumptious. They're fantastic. And look at these amazing fruits. And are these all from your garden? Mm-hmm. Aqui é cupuaçu. Cupuaçu. Okay. Wow. Oh, that's mad tasting. It's kind of like a cross between a banana and a mango. Mm. That's very interesting. Bakuri. Bakuri. It's yeah. another mad looking fruit, this one. Okay, here it goes. Mm. Wow! That is totally incredible. It's really kind of zesty, it's got creamy. Oh, that's amazing. Totally amazing. I'm just going to dive into this one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's very bitter. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah. No, that wasn't very nice. But... Oh, you have to you have to cook this one. The café de Munho. Oh, well, I think I need to have a bit more of this because uh, that tastes a lot better. Oh, that's better. Mm. Now that one really is my favourite rosemary. Thank you. What an experience. Thank you. <laughs> Many of the foods that grow here in the jungle can be eaten as you find them. 
but not this baby. It's called manioc. It's incredibly versatile, and the Brazilians love it. In fact, they eat it with virtually every meal. The tapioca flour we saw earlier at Rosemarinas is made from manioc. The native Indians discovered that the root is poisonous when raw. So to purify it, they invented an ingenious method of straining off the poisonous juices from the grated pulp. After the liquid is drained out, the manioc is washed and the grains are toasted over a hot fire. It can be served as a sort of nutty couscous or refined into tapioca flour to make the pancakes that the children love. Amidst all this strangeness, you suddenly come across something familiar. Wow, so that's a real fresh Brazil nut. But you wouldn't want one of them to land in your head. <laughs> wow, it's a tough old thing, isn't it? <laughs> oh, there's lots inside. Check this out. They're like kind of orange segments, but of nuts. There's about maybe 10 or 12 inside here. I never knew that about a Brazil nut. I just thought they were one big one. That's fantastic. It was the native Indians that taught the first colonists how to use the fruits of the forest. This is the acai tree, and its berries are used all over Brazil for their energizing properties. And you certainly need plenty of energy to climb these trees every day. Well done. <laughs> Wow! So this is the little berry they are so mad about all over Brazil. Vast quantities of acai leave the Amazon every day for the city markets. If you want to get an idea of just how much food comes out of the Amazonian rivers and jungle, then look no further than the Vero Peso market. It's like a window display of all that the jungle has to offer. At this vast dockside market here in Belém, Fishing boats and fruit barges come and go with the tides. Vero Peso means see the weight, and the market is where goods were once weighed to gauge taxes. The best time to visit the market is early morning, when all the wholesalers are in a frenzy of activity. I'm surrounded by papunia in various stages of ripeness, and this one is perfect to eat now. And like everything that comes from the Amazon, it's not just a food. This is supposed to have relaxing properties, and they use it in everything from juices, cocktails, and even pickles. The Amazonians love jambo leaves, which they use to flavor stews and soups. The local cafes around the market serve up delicious chowders from early morning until mid-afternoon. Jambo leaves are seasonal and have a very distinctive flavor, which isn't to everyone's taste. Raw, they've got the kind of maddest taste, really kind of zesty. My tongue is tingling, it's crossed between a stinging nettle and a lime. Mmm, very, very odd flavour. However, in one of the favourite dishes here called takaka, it's like a snack they eat in the afternoon. It's supposed to taste delicious, so... Oh, wow. And that is altogether a completely different experience. Oh, the jumbo leaves have lent this kind of incredible, zesty flavour, but it's completely different to lemon. And you can see this beautiful yellow colour. That comes from manioc, which is um, not in root form this time, but more in a kind of jelly form. It is so incredible. Thank you. Oh, it's delicious. Thank you. Excuse me, I'm really sorry, but I just have to ask you, what on earth are you eating here? This is acai. Acai, the berries. I saw them being picked in the Amazon. Yeah. You want to try? I think, do I? Try a little bit. You're going to like it. OK, here goes. Dip. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Very different, isn't it? It tastes kind of like dirty chocolate. Exactly. <laughs> But if it makes me feel good and it's got all these good things in it, then yeah. maybe I should have another spoonful. Will it, yeah, will it sure. make me get kind of full of zing for the day? Mm, it'll help. <laughs> <laughs> there are plenty of other things to give you a zing for the day in Belém Market. Over 650 medicinal herbs from the forest can be found here to cure everything from rheumatism to your libido.
There really is a little bottle of something for every ailment in life here. This little blue one is to help you win in life. And there's one here called the love hug, to help people love you and want to hug you. And there's one for those men that might need a little bit of oomph, natural Viagra. Another thing to give you oomph is the Guarana Berry, which has become big business in Brazil. This is a Guarana drink stand where locals come to get their energy boost for the day, and that's because Guarana contains caffeine, and they love this particular drink. It's like a Guarana lemonade, and it's more popular than Coca-Cola. And this is like a sugar syrup, and it's made with the crushed berries, which are powdered down and mixed with sugar to make a syrup, and it goes into a smoothie, and that's what I'm gonna try. One smoothie, please. Ground cashew nuts peanuts, guarana powder, and guarana syrup, and even a quail's egg go into the smoothie along with dried milk. I'll have mine shaken, not stirred, please. Well, I'm not sure if I can manage all this, but I'll give it a go. Oh, thank you very much. Now, this should pick me up, and apparently it's also got aphrodisiac properties. Wow. That's like a cross between a peanut butter smoothie and a breakfast cereal. That's going to keep me going all day for sure. Mmm. The state of Pernambuco is a total cultural and culinary contrast to the Amazon. My journey takes me east to Recife, the modern capital. This is where the Portuguese colonists first landed in Brazil. The old hillside town on the outskirts of Recife is called Olinda, and it was the first capital of the state of Pernambuco. Olinda is a testament to Brazil's Portuguese colonial history. Founded in 1537, it's managed to hang on to its beautiful old buildings. Not surprisingly, it was designated a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in 1982. When the Portuguese first arrived, they declared Olinda, which means pretty place, and the name stuck. Now this sleepy little town is a haven for more artists than anywhere else in Brazil, and it's a great place to visit if you're a foodie. Traces of the Portuguese heritage can be seen everywhere in the food here, and this is a classic example. It's a tapioca taco filled with cheese. Now, the Portuguese originally bought the cheese here, but to give this local speciality a Brazilian twist, they've added grated coconut. Mm, now, that's a very weird combination, but it actually really works. It's really scrummy. Mm. I couldn't possibly come to Alinda without trying the award-winning restaurant, the Oficina do Sabor, which translates as the taste office, and it's supposed to be the best in the region. The restaurant is popular for leisurely weekend lunches. The wealthy people from Recife indulge themselves on the chef's latest creations. The happy César has every reason to be proud of his menu. They also have Portuguese specialities here, like the classic Caldo Verde and, of course, salt cod fritters. Now, the Portuguese love their cod so much. They preserved it in salt so it would survive the journey from Portugal to Brazil. But this, this is the pièce de résistance, the house speciality. And it's prawns, and it's cooked in pumpkin with a mango sauce. So let's have a try. It smells awesome. Mmm. That is absolutely gorgeous. Really creamy. The mango has this delicious sweetness. It's absolutely fantastic. And with this house cocktail, aren't I a lucky girl? An hour and a half's drive south down the coast from Melinda, you come to Porto de Galinas, which is now a holiday resort. The name means Port of Chickens because slaves arrived here in cages which looked like chicken crates. I'm not sure about the dreadful non-PC chicken sculptures, but one thing I am sure about is that this is a fantastic place to drive a beach buggy. Motoring through the palm trees with a tropical breeze to caress you is my idea of heaven. The 
national cocktail here in Brazil is a caipirinha. It's made with cachaça, which is like Brazilian rum. And these guys not only drink it at lunch and dinner, but in fact, any time or any place. Hiya. Oh, thank you. That is so divine, I can't tell you. And it's incredibly simple to make. They take fresh lime juice, pinch of sugar, loads of cachaça, shake it over ice, and that's it. And it's absolutely heavenly. Mm. Cachaça is, of course, made from sugar cane. And Pernambuco was once the producer of all the world's sugar. When the Portuguese arrived in the 16th century, they immediately saw that the climate and soil were perfect for the growing of sugarcane. The plantations are still thriving today, which is just as well because the Brazilians have inherited the Portuguese passion for all things sweet. Also from Portugal came Pousadas, small family-run hotels centered around good homemade food. The Pousada do Amparo is known for its delectable desserts. As I'm in the heart of sticky, sweet sugar country, I thought I'd make a really creamy dessert that captures the essence of Brazil. It's got sugar in it, of course, cachaça, lime, and it's incredibly simple to make. First of all, you take some very lightly whipped cream, and it's taken to the soft peak stage, which means it's not completely whipped. And to that, I'm going to add some sugar syrup and a little bit of cachaça. But of course, you could use any white rum you wanted. Perfect. And then I'm going to pour in the juice of two limes, make it nice and zesty and citrusy. So we just put a little bit of our sugar syrup mix into the bottom of the bowl. And to that, I'm going to add just a little bit of cream initially. You have to be so gentle with this because you just, the one thing you don't want is all the air and lightness to come out of it. Add a little bit more of our wonderful smelling cachaça. Oh, it's like a sort of cachaça, sort of creamy delight, this. And another luscious spoonful of our cream. Mm. And then just finally, the last bit, give it a really, I think we can probably add the remainder of the cream now. Let's just tip the rest of this wonderful whipped cream, like that. Tip it all in and then again, just very gently fold it all together. And now, one of my favorite ingredients, lime zest. Oh, the smell is just incredible. And it's really important to do it over the bowl because as you zest, all these wonderful oils come out. And be careful not to get the white pith though because it's very bitter. So final, gentle, gentle fold. And you have to treat it very carefully and kindly, mousse, like that. And that is basically it. And the great thing is you can serve them in a really pretty glass like this. And they'll look so beautiful. It's a really great way to show it off. Chill for one hour before serving, or if making in advance, add a touch of gelatin to the syrup. When the Portuguese came to Brazil, they didn't just bring their food, they brought their religion and traditional celebrations. In the middle of nowhere, Nova Jerusalem is the biggest outdoor theatre in the world, at 200,000 square feet. It's actually a third of the size of the Jerusalem in Jesus' day. Now, every Easter for eight days, they hold an incredible passion play, depicting the life of Jesus Christ. And of course, that includes the Last Supper. This year, the role of Jesus is being played by Luciano Zafir, one of Brazil's biggest heartthrobs, and I can understand why. Hi, Luciano. Hey. How you doing? Fine. I bought you a little something. I was worried about you having just bread and water. Uh, thank you. Okay. Brazilian flag colours, do you like it? Yeah, it's beautiful. Probably tastes great too. Let's eat it after the show. Okay, yeah, you might sink if you have all of that now. <laughs> yeah. So tell me, what's your favourite Brazilian food? A lot of salad. Uh, rice, beans, a uh, big steak and a huge plate of french fries. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very Brazilian. <laughs> not very Brazilian at all. But then who doesn't like french fries occasionally? I know. So if you really did have a last supper, what would you eat? Mm. Cake! Cake, everything sweet on. Uh, ice cream, chocolate, all kind of well, maybe, sweetness. Maybe we could speak to the guys and instead of giving your poor disciples bread and water tonight, let's give them some cake. No, that's not a good idea. <laughs> I'm going to have to split that. I'm not Jesus, I'm going to keep it for me. <laughs> the crowds are starting to gather and tonight they're expecting over 6,000 people. 
Each scene takes place on one of 12 stages, and with 500 extras and 50 actors, this really is the most fantastic spectacle. If you get hungry during the performance, there are dozens of stalls around the theatre selling tasty snacks. You'll find plenty of barbecued goat, and they even have barbecued goat's cheese. Well, now that's a first, a toasted cheese kebab. It's all cheese. Mm. Now that really is delicious. Mm. The audience moves from one stage to another as the story unfolds. The Last Supper is magnificently staged. Luciano is giving the performance of his life. While the devotees feed their souls, the oblivious storeholders carry on cooking. Now this is local goat. It's been cured, salted, and then hung and grilled on the barbecue. And typically here in Brazil, it's served with manioc, so here goes. I'm not sure how young that goat was, actually. Not surprisingly, on the Easter weekend, the Passion Play attracts thousands of people from all over Brazil, so the storeholders have plenty of customers. I can see the Portuguese influence once again in these typical pastries. Obrigada. Now, this is a pastel, which is a kind of Brazilian pastry. The pastries felt really thin and then deep fried, and they eat them everywhere. This one's stuffed with cheese. Mm. And that will definitely keep me going through the Passion Play. Mm. The climax of the evening is, of course, the resurrection. What a spectacular end to my stay in Pernambuco. 2,000 miles south, the landscape turns into savanna. My journey takes me from Recife to Porto Alegre in the heart of the Rio Grande do Sul. 350 years after the Portuguese first came to Brazil, other European immigrants arrived, bringing their own culinary heritage. This beautiful countryside is cattle country and home to one of Brazil's biggest exports. The beef produced on these sweet pastures is of the highest quality. Most of the cowboys, or gauchos as they're known here, are proud members of the Society for Gaucho Traditions. To find out more about the gaucho culture, I spoke to Vanessa Schuler, who knows everything there is to know about this close-knit community. Where did the gauchos originate from? The Portuguese and the Spanish that were, came to Brazil, they are nearly all men. So they fall in love for the <laughs> native Indian women that live in here. The gaucho was a result of this mix. And here, how important is the meat in your cuisine? The meat is the most important thing in our cuisine. The gaucho must have red meat every day. And I mean red meat. It can be uh, fish or chicken. Real proper man's meat. Yeah, proper man meat. <laughs> And uh, tell me something, how does your uh, meat compare to Argentinian? Um, for sure, our meat is the best. <laughs> and our meat is the best in the world. So why don't you come with me and I cook for you one of my favorite dishes. I'd love to, thank okay, you. Okay, let's go. Great. Tell me a little bit more about this favorite dish of yours. So the dish we are going to make is called arroz de carreteiro. Arroz de carreteiro. <laughs> yes, this is Gaucho's favorite dish. First of all, I'd like you to make a paste with some peppercorns, salt and garlic. And you use plenty of salt, don't you? Yes. Okay. And all the garlic? Yes, please. Perfect. And then just bash it. I like it. I get the hard job. <laughs> okay, so what next? Then oil and onions. That's all over here. Okay, so add some oil. Generous. 
Yes, checks. Oh, the pan's okay. lovely and hot. Oh. Then the onions. All the onions? Yes, all the onions. So, and do you want to add the paste to this? Yes, then add the paste. Oh, this is so heavy. <laughs> that looks nicely softened. Yes. Yep. The almost done. Go in now. Yes. Right now. Wow, and that's quite a bowl of meat you're putting in here. <laughs> Yes, remember, it's meat with fries, not rice with meat. Oh, yeah. You cowboys, you like your meat, don't yeah, you? Yeah, they need meat. <laughs> so you're just going to fry that to seal the meat, yes. are you now? OK. OK. Now, this dish translates as wagoner's rice. Why was it called wagoner's rice? Because in the past, the gauchos used wagons to transport the, the meat. Uh, it was made with dry meat in the beginning because it's much, much easier to, for transportation. Oh, of course, because they didn't have refrigeration like we do now. Exactly. Oh, I see. Now, how many tomatoes do you want me to chop? Uh, four would be enough. Lovely tomatoes. So, originally, would these ingredients, things like tomatoes and peppers, always been in a wagon of rice? No. The recipe that we are making here is from my grandma. She has some Spanish background, so this is the reason why you use so much pepper and tomatoes. Well, I think the Spanish have definitely added a bit of colour to the wagoner's rice. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Great. So, what goes in first? Tomatoes. OK. We need to bring that up to the boil, do we? Because this is going to form sort of the sauce, isn't it? Exactly. Do you want the peppers? Yes, please. You can. They're like rainbow colours, aren't they? I think we are ready for the rice. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And this is long grain rice, isn't it? Yes, it should be. It's almost like a paella, this, isn't it? Like kind of a version yes. of paella. Yes. So it's very colourful. Really colourful. Add the water then. How much water are you adding here? Um, two and a half times the measurement of rice. Ah, so you do it by volume. So yeah. if you have a glass of rice, you yeah. then have two and a half glasses, OK. So, lid on? Yes. And how long is this going to take to cook? About 20, 25 minutes. Oh, we can have a sit down. Oh, yeah. Boiling. Oh. <laughs> Barbecued lamb is on the menu for lunch today. To keep their seats in the saddle all day long, the gauchos need energy, so a hefty meal is eaten at high noon. They always start with meat, and I just hope that our rice dish is going to match up to their usual standards. Chop a little spring onion and some parsley to garnish our rice, which looks mouth-watering. Et voila. There we go. And do you think the gauchos would mind if we had a quick taste? I think we've done a really good job, eh? Yeah, yeah, we are a good team. Very good team. Churrasco is a veritable orgy of spit-roasted barbecued meat. This truly is a meat lover's paradise. The meat looks mouth-watering really good. Ooh. <laughs> and the great thing is you can eat as much as you want for about $7. And you know something? The meat just keeps on coming. <laughs> I've had sirloin, rib, 
rump and sausage and the quality of the meat was so flavorous it was so succulent and i've definitely overdone it <laughs> please no more i can't take any more meat thank you oh oh One of the touristy things to do here is go on an excursion called Rota do Vino, which translates as wine run. I'm catching the Smoky Mary train into the heart of Brazilian wine country to see how the Italian immigrants have influenced the way of life here. The beautifully restored steam train leaves Bento Gonzalez three times a week to take carriage loads of wine enthusiasts on a voyage of discovery. Vast chunks of the Rio Grande do Sul were inhabited by Italian and German immigrants in the 19th century. The Italians were lured here in the late 1800s by cheap, fertile land. It was perfect for cultivating the vines that they brought with them in their suitcases. The Valle do Vinheiros, or the Valley of the Vineyards, stretches for miles and miles. One of the best wineries is Miolo, a family-run business. Wine might not be the first thing that springs to mind when we think of Brazil, but in fact, this region makes everything from Cabernet Sauvignon to Chardonnay. The Miolo family are proud of their wines, and luckily for me, Carlos Nogueira, one of the managers, has invited me to sample some wines over a mid-morning breakfast. Wow, Carlos, this spread looks fantastic. I feel like I'm in Italy. Yes, this is colazione. Now that means breakfast in Italian, doesn't it? Yes, our Italian ancestors taught us how to make this food. So you actually make these foods here in Brazil? Yes. Well, and of course the wine, which I'm dying to try. So which is the first one? This is Sauvignon Blanc which of course I've heard of. Never had a Brazilian one before. I'm impressed. This Very is my... fruity and it's lovely, delicious, really delicious. Yes, this is my favorite. This is Pinot Noir. Oh, I know I like Pinot Noir too. We'll try. Oh, that's really nice. I'm really, really impressed. And how long have you been making this wine here? Uh, Miolo's family came here a hundred years ago, but they just started to produce wines uh, ten years ago. Ten years? Yeah. Well, I think you're doing pretty well. Here's to Brazilian wine. Yes. For me, Brazil's exotic culinary history comes together in multicultural Rio de Janeiro. The final leg of my journey takes me to one of the party capitals of the world. Now the first place you're going to come to when you get to Rio, it's going to be the beach. And don't worry, you won't starve here either. There are vendors selling snacks to suit every palate. Ooh. <laughs> Hi. Whoa. What have you got? A kibe. One kibe, please, yes. Thank you. Kibe is made from minced lamb, herbs and spices. And it's an Afro-Middle Eastern snack. here. Absolutely delicious and with the chilli on top. Mm. Ah, this is tea. And this is limon. Ah, oh, lemon. Wow, obrigada. Ooh, and that is so refreshing. This mate tea they drink everywhere in Brazil. It comes from Porto Alegre and it's a herbal kind of tea. Normally drunk hot, but here in Rio, after lying on the beach too long and too much sun, cold, it's very refreshing. Mmm! Stefan Puman. Oh, obrigada. Mmm, sweet, juicy, perfectly ripe. Ah. Oh. Thank you. I love you. <laughs> Brazil is one of the world's largest coffee producers, but surprisingly, they don't really have coffee bars. Instead, they have botakins like these. Now, this one's called Hotfoot because you're supposed to hotfoot your way in, grab a coffee, hotfoot your way out. Avogada. Now they drink it here, short, strong, and very sugary, but I'm gonna to be tough and go for it straight. 
Wow, that's got a kick like a mule. That'll keep my feet hot for the day, I think. No one coming to Rio should miss out on a visit to the classy colonial Café Colombo. In the upstairs salon on Saturdays, they serve Brazil's national dish, feijoada. Feijoada is a rich, meaty stew made with a huge variety of meat offcuts mixed with black beans. The ingredients are cooked for several hours until tender. Rio is reputed to have the best feijoada in Brazil. And at the Café de Colombo, they separate the meat into large pots so that their customers can choose what they want to eat. Kale tossed in garlic is one of the classic side dishes. For a novice like me, it's all a bit daunting, so I've arranged to meet a feijoada aficionado here for lunch. Fernando Continentino is from Rio, and like most locals, loves this dish. Hi, Fernando. Hello. <laughs> I hear you're one of this restaurant's best customers. Sure I am. Every Saturday I'm here. I'll tell you the whole story. The African slaves used to receive from their masters the off-cut meat, and they made a delicious dish, which is now our national dish. What's that? Pigs. Yeah. <laughs> It smells good, I have to say. It does smell it's good. It's really, really, really Smoked nice. tongue. Is that worth giving a go to? Yeah. That's, that's good. That's really, really nice. Ah, oh, now this one. This is the kind of um, salted pork. And you of have Of course, some beans. the beans. Absolutely. Now, you couldn't have feijoada without the beans. There you go. OK. Kale isn't the only side dish. Others include sausages with onions. Plenty of manioc, of course and crispy pork rind. Do you like it? I never thought I'd say it, but actually all these bits and pieces of this piggy actually taste really, really delicious. And it's, everything's sort of meltingly tender and falling off the bone. But for me, the kind of star of the show has to be these beans. They've taken on all the flavours and it's kind of rich and hearty and, I mean, it's fantastic. Did you try the ears? Yeah, actually, I really like the ears. Very sort of buttery and just melt in your mouth. Did you, you didn't have some manioc, did you? You right. and your manioc, you guys have manioc with everything. But it's, the, the manioc does lend a kind of sort of crunch to it, doesn't it? And you know what I find really sort of ironic about this is that this dish that we're eating here which was originally something that slaves would have eaten and yet now, it's your national dish, and we're eating it in this fantastic location. You'd never have thought that would happen, would you? Never. It's really fantastic. Brazil intoxicates you with its variety and sense of adventure. I've loved the uniqueness and independence of each region. Awesome seafood in colourful Bahia, hearty, meaty gaucho food in Porto Alegre, and of course, Mother Nature's very, very own store, the Amazon. There are influences here from Spain, Portugal, Italy, and of course, Africa, yet somehow they've made them uniquely Brazilian. For me, it's been a food lover's dream.